Did you know that Austrian psychologist Sigmund Freud once said, we are never so defenseless against suffering as when we love? Wow, that sounds like a real headache. And did you know that Freud also once said, most people do not really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility and most people are frightened of responsibility. Wow, that sounds like a real headache. And, and did you know that Freud also, also once said, flowers are restful to look at because they have neither emotions nor conflicts. Wow, that sounds like a real headache. <sighs> are you even listening to me? Milkshakes. Milkshakes? Suffering because of love, responsibility, flowers without emotions or conflicts. Put them in a blender and what do you get? Milkshakes? No, you'll get a real headache. Okay then, welcome to part two of our series exploring revolutionary girl Utsuna. I am Khalil. And I'm the Unplugged Professor. And today, we're taking a look at the purity of Mickey Kaoru. Wow, that sounds like a real headache. Sometimes when I watch Revolutionary Girl Utsuna, it's easy for me to forget just how young some of these characters are meant to be. For example, Mickey Kaoru is only a middle school boy, even if he is a child piano prodigy. Mickey hasn't even graduated from 8th grade yet, and he's still very much a child, as is his sister Kozue, who is a middle school student at Atori. And yet, despite his age, Mickey seems to be a glutton for responsibility. Out of the whole series, he might be one of the most studious characters, He's taking college level classes, and during the Black Rose arc, he's invited to join the Makage seminar. Mickey also has the likely very tedious job of record keeper for the student council. In meetings, you'll usually see him keeping time with his stopwatch, jotting down notes, and when he does speak up at the meetings, usually it's just to repeat what others have said or to ask some simple questions. Mickey usually lets his upperclassmen make the important decisions, especially if it's Toga but to a lesser extent, also Jury, Sionji, and later Nanami. Although we never get any explicit confirmation on why it is that he joined the student council, I think it's safe to say it wasn't because he had some huge big plans he wanted to make at the school. Otherwise, we'd probably see him campaigning more at the meetings. And it also seems like, at least at the beginning, he wasn't even interested in the Rose Bride at all. We see through the first two episodes, based on Mickey in Season 1, how he starts to develop an interest in the duels. But prior to that, it seems like Mickey joined the student council because it naturally suited his personality type. Mickey likes responsibility. When Mickey is complimented on his piano playing, he'll insist it's still not good enough. Even when Mickey beats Jury in a fencing match, he will insist, it's still not good enough. Mickey blames himself when things go wrong, and whether it's his sister when they were children, Anthe, or perhaps even Toga, if Mickey likes someone, they can't do anything wrong in his eyes. In episode 4, Jerry comments that Mickey is a boy who doesn't deal with other kids much, so the picture we can paint of Mickey is that he is a highly talented boy, one who is always seeking to take on more responsibility, he keeps mostly to himself. He stays in the background. And because of that, he's never able to be fully satisfied with himself. But why not? What kept Mickey from fully accepting his own imperfections? Why is Mickey so obsessed with this idea of purity? Forget the power to revolutionize the world. The Rose Bride and the duels were something his upperclassmen were interested in. But Mickey, he was happy just taking notes. Really, the only thing Mickey could say his life was missing was, well, his shining thing. 
Utsuna will often use flashback scenes with characters silhouetted in order to show important memories or hang-ups that a main character might be thinking about. These scenes are the fairy tales that bind them, their own personal myths that keep them trapped. These are the shells that they need to break if they are to become free. With Mickey, we see repeated flashbacks of him and his sister playing piano out in that original sunlit garden of his childhood. Mickey romanticizes his sister. And I don't mean romantic as in he literally wants to date his sister. But who? Why? Uh, don't worry, we'll touch on that later. But rather, he romanticizes his sister Kozue because he views this childhood version of her as some sort of perfect, pure angel. Mickey's happiest memories were when he was in the garden with Kozue. He felt complete and satisfied with himself, so long as he was there with his sister, playing the piano. This feeling of spending time with someone so pure and innocent, it's his shining thing. It's something he probably thought would go on forever. Too bad she was not really the best when it came to the piano. And not only was her ability a bit lacking, she also wasn't nearly as into it as Mickey was. She just kind of went along with it because she knew it made her brother happy. Through no fault of his own, Mickey got sick the night of a big performance. Kozue was asked to perform in front of a huge crowd all by herself, without her brother. And so she ran away. And from that point on, the two didn't play together anymore. Logically, it doesn't make much sense to blame yourself for getting sick. Mickey couldn't have helped that he got sick. And Mickey is a smart boy, maybe the smartest student in the entire series but he won't let himself see the truth. Mickey feels a need to blame himself for what happened. And worse yet, these mental hangups prevent him from realistically viewing Kozue as a whole person. He reduces Kozue as a person to either a little angel when she was younger, or to a rotten witch when she becomes older. When we see him interact with Kozue in the present, this is why he is often so very harsh and very distrusting with her. This angel-witch dichotomy, which is also known as the Madonna Whore Complex, is something a feminist critic might cite as problematic in a lot of stories, because in the real world, women aren't all good angels or all bad witches. Real people are a lot more complex than that. But Mickey starts to fetishize his memories of his little angel sister, and he won't be satisfied with himself until he can have that again. And it's this baggage that Toga, Akio, and Anthe exploit. Akio and Anthe's manipulations in the first season are often more covert, but Toga is able to act more directly with Mickey. The show doesn't explain much about this, but Mickey probably looks up to Toga a lot. Mickey talks with both Toga and Nanami while playing the piano. While Mickey is distrustful of adults, Toga is someone in between past childhood, but not yet into adulthood. It's not hard to see how an impressionable 13-year-old, awkwardly on the cusp of puberty and feeling unfulfilled in his life, would look up to the student council president and see someone with pure confidence, and, importantly, dominance, to reach out and take what he wants. I mean, just look at him. Who wouldn't want to be just like this stallion? So when Mickey catches Toga making moves on his sister Kozue, when Toga tells Mickey that he has to take action, or the things he cares about most will be taken away from him, Mickey takes it to heart, big time. Mickey won't fight Toga for Kozue. He lost the Kozue he cared about years ago when she stopped being pure enough for him. Instead, he wants to find his shining thing, that pure angel, not in Kozue, but this time in Anthe, the Rose Bride. But to what extent Mickey understands the real nature of his feelings toward Anthe is unclear. When he is asked if Nanami is his girlfriend, Mickey blushes like crazy. You see, unlike Toga, Mickey doesn't have experience in this area. Even just the thought of having a girlfriend makes him uncomfortable. You can see this from the start, even in episode one, when the student council is debating Sayonji's treatment of the Rose Bride. Notice how Mickey nervously repeats the phrase, As he pleases. The cold sweat he is in as he nearly breaks his pencil writing notes. Mickey isn't comfortable with sexuality. It doesn't fit into his narrow idea of purity. 
So it's worth noting that when Mickey is around Anthe, he doesn't usually have that nervousness. He treats her like she's a perfect angel. It's a weirdly childlike and innocent feeling. When Nanami tries her hardest to make Anthe look like a big weirdo, Mickey doesn't bat an eye, even as he finds out that Anthe keeps pet snails in her pencil box, harbors a pet mongoose, and even has a giant inflatable octopus in her closet. Rather, it's just like Miss Himamiya to do that. He thinks it's all cute and endearing because it's Anthe. In episode 8, he blames himself for the curry explosion that switches Utena and Anthe's personalities. Supposedly, it's his fault somehow because he's the one that wanted curry. Rather than put any blame on Anthe, he internalizes the situation and blames his own desires instead. In that same curry episode, when Anthe starts to act like Utena, he says adamantly, That can't be gentle, innocent Miss Anthe. Mickey's ideal of a sweet, innocent Anthe doesn't leave room for the fighting spirit, assertiveness, or strong opinions Utena has. In other words, his real Anthe doesn't have that much of a personality. I'll put it bluntly. The reason Anthe reminds Mickey so much of his little sister is because to him, Anthe is just as neutral, accepting, and pure. He can view both of them as passive blank slates. And this is a big problem. Mickey's idea of purity is passivity and innocence. And Mickey thinks that he needs that purity, his shining thing, to be happy. But then he's told by Toga and Kozue that in order to get what he wants, he has to take action. That is, get his own hands dirty and become impure himself. This creates an unhealthy loop where Mickey's attempts to attain purity end up making him feel less pure. He doesn't have a stable way to look at his sister, himself, or any other teenager or adult because the only kind of person that matches Mickey's rigid criteria of purity would be someone who doesn't take action, a totally defenseless child or doll, like Anthe. Anthe reveals to Mickey that if Utena told her to stop playing the piano, Anthe would. Now, realistically, the odds of Utena specifically commanding Anthe to stop playing the piano are slim to none, and surely he must be able to realize that. But this is Mickey we're talking about. This is the same guy who fixates on playing one song over and over and over again. And while it's a good song, it's still one song. Right. And so, Mickey, determined to use Anthe as a surrogate for his sister, challenges Utena to a duel. And during this first duel, Mickey exclaims that he won't lose it again. All while the lyrics of his duel song, Scipio's Dream, reference concepts such as an idealized reality, theatrical performance, illusory minds and illusory people, immortal structures, and a wrecked ship which is also referenced in the Shadow Girls play. Mickey's sunlit garden is an idealized reality, a wrecked ship, an illusion. Yet it is an immortal structure that replays over and over in his head. The song ends with repetitions of my, 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 and death and rebirth. Mickey loses this first duel, but he vows that next time he will not lose, and not long after, when Toga is recovering from an injury, he jumps at the chance to duel again. So we return again to the question, why does Mickey want to duel? There's this moment where Mickey is in the Rose Garden with Anthe, and he remarks, This is just like that other garden. He's referring to the sunlit garden of his childhood. And, you know, this seems like an innocent, innocuous remark until you realize they are standing in a literal birdcage that represents Anthe's own imprisonment. Mickey identifies this literal, actual cage with what in fact really is his own cage. The cage of his memories, which traps him in the past. It's the real reason he isn't satisfied. He's right. They are similar gardens. But he probably lacks the self-awareness to realize what the illusion truly is. Unless... Is he 
really desperate enough to willingly lock himself and Anthe in that cage forever? I think it's understandable to think of Mickey as a nice boy, someone sweet and supportive who really means well, the innocent and friendly one in the student council. Just a little naive, but otherwise a normal boy, growing up in a confused world. But it's also very possible to view Mickey as quite the opposite, as one of the most messed up and psychologically damaged characters in Utna. And this narrative comes into further question when his mental state deteriorates even further after the student council arc. And thus, the Black Rose blooms. I love my big brother, even if we're nothing alike. We actually used to be really similar. But you know, that was when we were still little kids. But now that I've grown up, it's different. I've learned that in this world, people take what they want by force. There are winners and there are losers. People who don't use their power, lose their power. And there's more than one kind of power. My brother doesn't realize that yet. He doesn't know that good things don't come to those who wait, and that's what causes him pain. Despite the appearance he puts on that he's alright, I'm all he ever thinks about. That's right. It's the one mark against his purity. It's a dirty little secret that only I know about. When I get hurt, or disgraced, it hurts him terribly inside. And that's why I intentionally date boys I know he disapproves of. But his heart is drifting further and further towards that girl further away from me, that girl with the glasses. I know he has a photo of her in his notebook. If he really wanted her, he should take her. Now that I think of it, maybe it would be refreshing to see my brother give in to some of his desires for once. I told a certain girl that I loved her, but she turned me down. Why? I love my big brother, she said. Eh, that's a lie. That story was fiction. The reason sexuality is so often expressed in brother-sister relationships is probably because there's the illusion that blood relationships are eternal. It's the dream of the eternal lover. Continuing with the lie, I tried pathetically, refusing to back down. I couldn't accept it. But you're brother and sister. My brother's body's a part of me and my body is a part of him, she said. Kunihiko Ikahara. Episode 15 of Revolutionary Girl Utna is titled The Landscape Framed by Kozue, and it is one of the Black Rose Arc episodes focusing on a character strongly connected to a student council member. In this case, Kozue, Mickey's little sister. In a previous episode, episode 6, Mickey could easily recognize and call out Nanami's big brother complex, without seeming to realize the nature of his own brother-sister relationship with Kozue. After seeing Mickey try to make Anthe his new shining thing in the student council arc, viewers finally get to meet Kozue at her current age, and now we can finally piece together why Mickey had given up on his past shining thing. Well, Anthe was a perfect blank slate because of her passivity, Kozue is assertive, bold, wild even. She doesn't have the lofty goals or long-term aspirations, but she is living in the moment and enjoying herself, often in ways Mickey ain't so happy about. As young children, the two had been so close, it's almost as if they functioned as one body. But now they are in middle school, this body has been severed. Right brain from the left brain, the id from the superego. Mickey has the caution and polite disposition that Kozue, in her brashness, lacks. But Mickey's pursuit of order and purity makes him high-strung and never satisfied with himself. He can be so worried about showing up late that he will show up 40 minutes early to a meeting and just wait. He will meticulously reset his stopwatch on one-minute intervals while he naps because even oversleeping would be an oversight for a perfect student. Mickey cares an unhealthy amount of timelessness and the minutia of rules. Khalil and I think that's why he's always bringing out his stopwatch. He's stuck, fixated on having order and structure, 
Meanwhile, Kosue does not seem to care what happens to her immediate pleasures, so each sibling has what the other lacks. Let's say we were to put Mickey and Kosue into a blender and make them into a Kaoru milkshake. Well, I understand that would be very illegal and very gory. It would create an ideal self. One not so bound by expectations of purity that they hurt themselves, but also not so free from responsibility that they hurt others. Possibly the strongest connection Mickey and Kosue still share at this point in the series is their mutual distrust for adults. Even as both of them are entering puberty and becoming more adult in different ways. Mickey acts too mature for his age, like he's trying to be an adult in the room with his peers. But Kosue is moving on to more adult things when it comes to her various campus flings. And while both distrust adults, Kosue seems more savvy about it. When a teacher lecherously puts his arms around Mickey's waist, the boy does not appear to be alarmed. But Kosue realizes this man could, in her words, sully Mickey. So, she pushes him down a flight of stairs. And I mean, sure, that makes sense. Creepy teacher be creeping. So you push him down some stairs. That tracks. Despite all her talk of being a wild animal who takes what she wants, note that she does not want Mickey sullied. She doesn't really want Mickey to get hurt. The problem appears that in order to protect Mickey, she feels she has to possess him, which is a running theme for both the Kaoru siblings. When Mickey falls asleep on the piano, Kozue leans down to kiss him and remembers their past and also maybe who they've transformed into now. And when Anthe enters, Kozue's face reads of distrust. In her elevator descent, as she goes deeper into her buried feelings, she clutches sheet music, probably for the Sunlight Garden and other songs they'd play together. And it's as the elevator races to the bottom that she explains her motivation to duel Utna and kill the Rose Bride. Mickey is drifting further and further away from her and closer to that girl, Anthe Himamiya. Maybe Kozue does this because she truly does want Mickey all to herself, because everything she does that is bad is her way of getting Mickey's attention. And now he's paying more attention to someone else. But perhaps we can be more charitable to Kozue and argue that alongside this more selfish desire, maybe she sees Anthea as dangerous, someone who, like the predatory teacher, could soil Mickey. Maybe she sees through Anthea and knows, whether consciously or not, that Anthea is not the person she seems to be, and has put a spell on her brother, so to speak. Thus, Kozue goes to Mickey and draws forth from him a sword, a sword of their bond, to go against the sword of Dios, which is the bond between Anthea and Dios, two brother-sister relationships face in combat, which shall reign supreme. Anthe and Dios, that's the answer. Anthe and Dios reign supreme. And this is as good a time as any to address the elephant in the room. The elephant known as incest. <laughs> Anthe and Akio have an actually incestuous relationship, as is revealed much later in the show. While Nanami and Toka's relationship is not sexual... Neither is Mickey and Kozue's, at least not in a direct, surface kind of way. Mickey has displaced his interest in his sister onto the Rose Bride, where that interest in the purity of his younger sister has boiled into the primordial soup of puberty, into a bizarre half-platonic and half-sexual interest in Anthe. Kozue's sexual interests lie in other men. Not in her brother, but it's also true that those are fun flings, and the real eternal love resides forever with her brother. When Kozue draws the sword from Mickey's chest, we get the phallic light cast down from the window, extending from Mickey to Kozue. Kozue reaches down towards Mickey's crotch, wherein she says, ostensibly about their rings, 
Mine is just like yours. Before drawing forth his sword, another potentially phallic symbol, while one hand draws the sword, we don't see how far her other hand goes. And if you think it's a stretch to call this scene sexually charged, note that two episodes later in episode 17, Nanami asks if it hurt when Kozue pulled the sword out of Mickey. And while Nanami doesn't blush while asking that because she's simply asking a question, Mickey's face goes full on rose red immediately. Mickey reads the question in a perverted, sexual way. And if you want to get real psychoanalytical up in here, the name Mickey means tree trunk and Kozue means tree top. Mickey is the stable hard wood at the bottom and Kozue is on top where there may be bushes, flowers. As young children, they were one body, but now their different paths threaten to cut them apart. In the Black Rose arc, Kozue is trying to keep them together no matter what the cost might be, even if it means killing the Rose Bride. When Kozue had a problem, it's safe to assume Mickey was there to fix it. When their parents divorced, the two were so young, they were confused and afraid and could only find solace within each other. At that time, to Kozue, Mickey was the only boy she would ever love. He was her prince, and he kept her safe in the garden, their kingdom. By turning herself into the town whore, she can keep him up late thinking of her. Dollface. Kozue becomes knowledgeable in the areas Mickey won't venture into. Thus, from one of their trees, they branch out in two opposing directions. It's the chicken and the egg scenario. Did Kozue pursue her wild and impulsive nature because Mickey had first become rigid in his austere pursuit of purity and rules? Or did Mickey only begin to walk this straighter and narrower path because of what he saw Kozue already pursuing in her sensuality? They each distrust adults, but in each other, they can see an aspect of a future adult staring them right in the face. When Mickey looks at Kozue, he can see the way adults break the rules and fall into their desires without thinking of others. And when Kozue looks at Mickey, she can see the ways adults restrict themselves with their rules and thus live dry, boring lives. Of course, Kozue loses to Utna, and the Rose Bride lives on. But the seeds have been planted for future discord. Akio's hopes grow that these twin saplings might produce a prince whose ambition and will could open the door to eternity and revolutionize the world. But when put to the test, will Mickey's attachments be strong enough to earn him the win or will he have to dirty his own hands and forsake purity to finally possess his shining thing? Something that keeps turning in revolutions could be said to be revolutionary, and yet spinning around in an endless routine, repeating the same mistakes over and over, could hardly be called a proper revolution. What does it even mean when the student council members say that they are fighting to revolutionize the world? What do they think that means? And are they even right? Mickey's life has been revolving, spinning, looping around the memory of the sunlit garden, and nothing he does in the present could ever be good enough. Because in the back of his mind, the melody he and his sister used to play keeps wrapping tighter and tighter around his thoughts. But Mickey was presented with a chance to reclaim the kingdom he had lost. He might not have understood it in concrete terms, but he felt that if he could win the Rose Bride, he could have that shining thing again. And the cycle could continue, with Anthe playing the piano in place of the younger sister from his childhood. Much of Revolutionary Girl Utsuna can be simplified to the idea that the things we think we want are often the very things that keep us from getting the things we need. Mickey wants to continue staying in his coffin, 
in the prison garden of his childhood because he fails to recognize that what he really needs to do is break out of it and move on with his life. Mickey is so close to the truth, but he doesn't see the full picture. None of the student council members realize that real revolution really does involve smashing things that are important to people. And often the things they need to smash are those past connections and relationships that now chain them down. Mickey has to smash his sister. Juri has to smash Shiori. Sayonji has to smash Toga. Nanami also has to smash Toga. Toga has to smash, uh, Toga? Smash himself? I don't know. Anyway, Anthe has to smash her brother. And Nemuro, he really just needs to smash. Toga tells Mickey that if he doesn't fight for what he wants, he won't get it. But you shouldn't fight for an illusion. Mickey shouldn't fight for his shining thing. Instead, he should revolt against it and in a way against himself. To be reborn stronger by breaking through his own personal shell. After all, unless the chick can escape its shell, it will die without truly being born. To a certain point, a shell is safe. It's your first home and your protection. But if you don't ever leave that shell or that egg, you will die. You will not live on to be born. Kozue risks injury to save a nest of baby birds. As Celeste puts it, Kozue and Mickey still share a room. And if you look at their headboards, you'll find that they have baby birds painted on them. Mickey and Kozue are represented by the baby birds in the nest. They are the baby birds being manipulated by selfish adults. After all, it must have been adults within the school who decided to cut down the tree despite the family living in it. It was Mickey and Kozue's parents who cut down the tree as well. They divorced and left the children behind, presumably as the baby birds were left behind when the parents realized the tree was getting cut down. The nest was lost, the home was taken away, and the children were split by their differing ways of looking at their parents' divorce. Mickey is an idealist, and Kozue is a realist. They were driven into these roles by divorce of their parents and the forced piano recital that culminated in disaster. Kozue is a character of extremes. And I mean, the symbolism here is potentially more important than whatever real world motivation Kozue had. She is desperate to save the birds and their home. Mickey, the tree trunk, was severed from Kozue, the tree top. The one who is rooted is cut off from the one who reaches for exhilarating heights. A curious thing happens when Mickey is on the phone and his father passes the phone over to his new stepmother. The voice he hears on the receiving end, as well as the image we see briefly on the screen, belongs to Anthe, which could mean one of two things. Either Anthe has actually been romantically involved with Mickey's father, and that's just like one of Anthe's side missions, or the mother isn't really Anthe at all, but Mickey imagines the voice on the other line to be Anthe. Like, he's in such a bizarre mental state that he superimposes in some freaky Oedipal way the voice of his love interest into the role not only of his sister, but now his new mother figure. In general, these final duels with the student council members can feel a bit vague and confusing, but thankfully, aside from this stuff about Anthe being his new mom, Mickey's actually might be one of the more straightforward motivations for the final arc. Kozue pushes Mickey forward to duel yet again by bringing him in contact with End of the World. The empty movement writer Dollface argues that she is pushing him forward toward the wrong direction as a form of reverse psychology, that she is setting Mickey up to fail on purpose. Because, as they put it, Perhaps after seeing how he could not grasp eternity with his own hands so recklessly, he would realize the life he would be able to have with Kozue. During the duel, Kozue is in the car revolving around the arena, and she prods at Mickey, reminding him to stay focused on the fight while she is kissing the Rose Bride. Mickey seems to be caught off guard by this action, and he loses the duel shortly after. If Kozue is trying to cause Mickey to fail on purpose, then perhaps she made advances on Anthe as a tactic to throw him off right at the crucial moment of the fight. She preyed on Mickey's repressed impurity and psychosexual hangups. Mickey is a Freudian hot mess, 
So seeing his real sister lean in to make out with the girl that he simultaneously looks at as both a love interest and a new replacement for his sister, well, that's a lot to fog up Mickey's imagination. But at the end of the episode, when Mickey is building the birdhouse, she calls him a coward. And why would she call him a coward if she was the one trying to set him up to lose? Another possibility is that Kozaway was actually trying to help Mickey win. She was distracting Anthe. And honestly, that might have been a brilliant tactic. It's not clear if Kozaway knows, either by intuition or from her conversations with Akio, aka her daddy long legs, but it's implied that Anthe's magic has given Utena the win in prior duels. It's how Utena can win with a broken kendo stick, how a miracle can happen with a sword falling perfectly straight down to cut off a rose, and it's how Makage can suddenly remember the exact truths from his past that would disorient him just enough to lose. If Kozue knows that Anthe is actually the key to Utena's victories, even if she just knows it implicitly, then maybe Kozue was actually disengaging the Rose Bride, and she was giving Mickey a clear path to victory. But it was Mickey that messed it up. She told him to keep his eyes on the prize, and all Mickey could pay attention to then was Kozue and Anthe, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Both of these interpretations work. Kozue might have been purposefully ruining Mickey's odds at victory, or perhaps her tactics of playing dirty backfired because Mickey's mind was too dirty after all. Either way, despite the clear tension between the siblings, Mickey is building a birdhouse. And at the end of the series, we get a scene with Mickey instructing the younger Mitsuru while Kozue watches by the piano. And from this, we can see glimmers that maybe these siblings are repairing their friendship. As Dollface puts it, Kozue has finally become comfortable in her relationship with Mickey enough to spend time with him in the very place that had torn them apart. Also, the fact that she sits far away from Mitsuru and Mickey shows that she has lost her possessive demeanor. She is able to let Mickey interact with another human being without trying to monopolize his emotions or push Mitsuru down a flight of stairs. Utna did not revolutionize the world. She revolutionized the people in it. Instead of looking at it as revolutionizing the world, we think it's actually more about revolutionizing your world to smash your world's shell, to be ready to cut out toxic relationships and free yourself from the tangles and chains of unhealthy thought patterns. Mickey was comfortable in his coffin, but no matter how comfortable a coffin is, staying in it ultimately means death. So was Mickey's shell broken? That's a toughie. And honestly, it's the issue that we have been going back and forward on in disagreement. I think he's better by the end. When he's playing badminton with Jury and Utna, he seems lighter in tone and overall in a better place mentally, and his relationship with Mitsuru could be really good for the both of them. Mickey can have a healthy mentor-like role, and Mitsuru could learn from Mickey. Mitsuru wants to grow up and be an adult, and Mickey could help him grow up to be the kind of adult that is trustworthy and reliable. And meanwhile, I usually am on the side that Mickey is just as bad, if not worse, by the end of the series. He's been pushed by Toga, Kozue, and Akio to take things by force, and he might turn into the very same kind of adult that he hates. As empty movement legend Giovanna puts it, You can easily see the innocent child genius that Makage once was, and you can actually observe Mickey coming to the conclusion Aggressive measures are the way to get what you want. Mickey from the beginning of the series would never have thought it okay to try and take Anthe by force. But by the Akio arc, he comes face to face with the reality of what he wants. And he embraces it. Genius is often joined by manipulation and pessimism in adults. And the best way to become a manipulative pessimist is to be the opposite in your youth. Few things are more effective at changing your path in life than having your beliefs and morals thoroughly crushed by your teen years, or being introduced into a society that leaves no room for the innocent and clean. 
I have my doubts that whatever is emerging from Mickey's shell is actually a healthy person. My thoughts focus on the anger in Mickey's exchange with Kozue while he's building that birdhouse. If Mickey is becoming the kind of adult that he and his sister hate, I fear that he may be harmful as a mentor, and I'm worried that he will help mold Mitsuru into something as unhealthy as he is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten seconds. Minutes, hours, days, months, years, seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, my, 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 my shining thing. Through the various iterations of Utna, there are qualities that remain universal for Miki Kaoru. Despite being only a middle school boy, his intelligence on both test papers and prowess of musical keys are impressive beyond belief. True, he does exhibit an innocence that can border into foolhardiness, but he is a child first. One can imagine the pressures would be immense and difficult to keep up with, but throughout the series, these things do not seem to face him. His determination stands strong, like the tree trunk he is. The main thing that catches Mickey off guard throughout the series is the idea of the shining thing, a goal as wondrous as princes, in my humble opinion. Perhaps that is why he is emphasized as a friend throughout the anime series, and even throughout other series as well. Miki Kaoru is similar yet different in the regards that a sharp or flat can be added to a note. It shifts the tone enough, but still Miki remains recognizable throughout these various forms. We are all very familiar with Miki and his desire for shining things through the anime series. But what if there just wasn't a shining thing to take away? Throughout the Chiyo Saito manga, Mickey is still Mickey as we know him in the anime, but the shining thing is not even close to a goal for a child. And, unless I am mistaken, or the translation is mistaken, not a single mention of the shining thing was present throughout. Regardless, Mickey still perseveres as a level-headed young man opposed to the duels. Not because of the need to free Anthe, in fact, he does not express any desire for Manthe at all throughout the book. Instead, over a course of interactions, Mickey becomes increasingly attracted to Utena, going from a nervous instance of a hug to a full-on prince-like complex. I say prince-like because of his need to protect, like a young version of Akio. As far as he sees it, Utena does not deserve to be flung into the duels themselves, and Mickey's desire to Utena comes into full swing in an argument with Toga Kiryu. These conflicts are what it means, in Toga's eyes, to love someone. Mickey, in response, wants the resignment of the entire student council in order to keep Utena from it all, though Toga is quick to bite back at the naive note-taker of the council. Utena was not meant to be protected, and that protecting someone is not a form of love. And thematically with Toga, a person whose philosophy is to break the protective shell of the egg, this debate of sorts is very enticing to me. It is a debate of sorts because Toga does what every good debater does, and locks Mickey outside of the room, which he does have every right to, seeing as this is his house Mickey broke into. Oh, I forgot to mention that detail, didn't I? <laughs> Yes, Mickey has actually been striking for Toga's throat constantly throughout the manga, questioning his intentions and character, and is someone very likely to take a stand against the injustice he sees. But he also does quite questionable things, as in, Oh gods, no, that's not good, Mickey! 
such as strike at someone when their emotions bubble over or even kiss Utena while she sleeps and overlooks the larger problems in his demeanor. He is assertive, bold, wild even. But if this is the case, where does this leave Kozue? Well, the twin of the Kaoru sibling is someone attached at the hip, metaphorically speaking, but it could be assumed she wouldn't mind it literally. She is so incredibly attached to Mickey that, with the looming desires of older classmates trying to capture Mickey's heart, Kozue is likely the one to bat them all away, which Kozue responds very defensively, openly mocking the grades of Utna, and even tagging along with Mickey as a third party if Utna is around. In fact, it is around the tutoring that the aforementioned kiss occurs, though instead of blaming Mickey, she instead unleashes her anger out on Utna. Mickey strikes her in response, and she runs away. Mickey is drifting away from her, and she is not taking the idea of such all too well. The idea of growing apart sends her into a storm of tears, with the only thing to comfort her is the deceptive hand of Anthe, who abducts her to threaten Mickey to continue the duels as the strange zodiac signs predict and continue the ascendance of Utna through Dios. At which, mild tangent, Toga makes it clear Mickey will fight despite his protests, and that the young scholar will want it. But when you threaten the well-being of a person they care about and say, You shall not have them unless you fully engage in swordplay! Do I really need to pull this book aside and teach it what consent is? Because it's having an alarming idea of what consent is! Anywho, the fight breaks out. Utena uses her instant win button as usual, yada yada, sister is saved thanks to the power of Dios, Powerpuff Girls parody ensues. Mickey clutches Kozue at this time, and Kozue apologizes for her behavior. Funny, maybe you should do that too, Mickey, as Mickey's belief in protecting the ones he loves was successful, but for another kind of love entirely. Though he is unable to stop Utena from dueling, this ideology never leaves the young man in his beliefs, as later in the series, he even sacrifices himself to Anthe so Utena may have the chance to escape, being sealed in a coffin by the name of immaturity at the end. This thread is something to explore, as we get closer to the witch's tapestry one day. Though the magics of Utena are no less present in the second manga released by Chio Saito after the revolution, this seems far more connected to the anime's interpretations of the characters behaving as epilogues for the characters of the series when they have fully grown. This seems far more connected to the anime interpretations of the characters behaving as epilogues for the characters of the series when they have fully grown. They are stories of kinship, individuality, and togetherness in many respects, led by an instance that is rather abnormal. In Mickey's case, Mickey is actually still very well acclaimed for his music, with his outfit being presented at the Music Hall of Atori Academy, as well as audiences being able to recognize his work being played to much fanfare. Such playing even catches the ear of Toka Kiryu, who casually contacts Mickey congratulating him on finishing his magnum opus. One complication though, that wasn't Mickey. Mickey in this tale is still lost, unable to complete his ideal song because of something missing amongst those notes, and is reasonably concerned about the doppelganger that has appeared. Mickey has more than this looming over him, as Kozue is even in a coma. Kozue is someone who could never go beyond her emotions for Mickey, even outright kissing him in multiple instances inside of the manga. He is the one she truly loves, but Mickey does take a solid stance against this. It is not that he does not care for his sibling and her happiness. He recognizes the severity of this incestual closeness and pushes away Kozue. Though, by his words, it's a feeling that should be locked away and forgotten. Perhaps this is how he too has dealt with such feelings. Kozue constantly blames herself for being sullied by her emotions towards Mickey. She has been abused by her husband, who is suspicious of her interests and ties her up to be subjected to unknown but heinous acts. 
Drenched in the rain with her brother, who is ready to have a word with her husband, she flings herself onto Mickey with a kiss, and is pushed away yet again, and believes it is better to return to her husband, the twisted and corrupted norm in her mind, than to face the rejections of Mickey, and thus she is flung into a coma. The manga ends on the two finally playing piano together to inevitably create a piano path for Utna to seek out Anthe, just go with it, and even confide finally with the feelings at hand. Talking about what they are, Mickey is the one to respond that these things between them are growing and evolving on a path of growth and change. They can rack their brains and it just won't change anything. They should not worry about these boundaries set between them. Keep going as they are, and keep living to reach those who reach out to them. To keep moving forward, instead of sealing all those ideas in a cage. These are the final notes that linger on beyond the siblings, as they play the piano once again. Then... There are the light novels, Twin Saplings, a title alone referencing the Kaoru siblings, and Verdant Hopes, which references more to Sayonji and Wakaba. Written by Ichiro Okochi and published by Shogakukan, Okochi puts it best in the afterword of the first book. This is the younger brother of revolutionary girl Utna, at least after the manga and the anime. And the younger brother it very much is. Not being a direct adaptation of the works, but another blend of ideas that takes our soprano voice child into familiar yet new territory. Notably, that is how he is referenced in multiple instances of the book. A soprano, for those less familiar with voice types, is the highest vocal range. The use of a higher register voice, like the one notable in the Japanese anime, is likely to also emphasize the androgynous appearance of Miki Kaoru and references in places such as the book that, if Mickey and Kozue were to switch their clothing and style their hair the same, it would be quite easy for them to switch places. And this would be very similar to many iterations of Utna, down to also the genius level of intelligence that Mickey emits, to his use of fencing and piano playing to emphasize a grace and might that comes from this impressive teenager. In fact, Jury makes a case within the text that, if it weren't for Mickey and the fencing club, even 20 students facing her in a marathon would be a rather dull competition. Likely, it is thanks to his adaptive techniques that he is also able to keep his mind and body in high standings. In a basketball competition that faced Mickey and Uten on opposite teams, Mickey can treat the entire affair as if it were a chess game, playing across feints and stalling to assure victory for his side. It is only thanks to Utena's desperation and willingness to act that her team got close to defeating this chess master at the game. And seeing Utna and Mickey geeking out about these sports continues to emphasize Mickey's friendly demeanor. Though there are moments of potential romantic tension between the two, mostly leaning on the side of Mickey, Utna cannot help but trust this young man whose truth lies within the pools of his irises. Mickey cannot help, as well, to aid Utna in her endeavors, as well as continue to be drawn towards the nature of this determined girl. That is right. It is yet again not Anthe that catches the eyes of Mickey, but rather Utna, whose soft, warm body and gallant smile, by his words, had at first distracted Mickey in his duties, but slowly grew into a deep affection, one that he wished to continue defending Utna and opposing the duels. There is, notably, no shining thing present here. While in the anime, sudden sickness had caused the most notable axe swing in their relationship, here in the light novels, there's no inciting incident. In fact, the Kaoru siblings seem more inseparable than ever, seeing as they share lunch with one another without needing to make separate portions, sleep together with their beds joined together, and even continue playing piano together. But it seems Kozue can only really play the sunlit garden by her own abilities. The jealousy Kozue exhibited in the manga is present as well, but is explored from her perspective a bit more. Ever since they were little, they shared nearly every moment and activity together. The only notable separation before Utna's arrival was the practicing of fencing, where she would argue with him for days because of the practice, seeing the bruises on his body, before accepting this side of him and cheering him on in games. The life of living as one body must one day end, but Kozue cannot help but cling on to her brother, likely in fear of that. 
Even making Mickey upset is a unique moment Kozue cherishes, being the only one who really gets to see this side of him, but does not wish to hurt Mickey outright. Kozue doesn't need to take drastic measures to get Mickey's attention. Kozue just needs Mickey himself. Similar to the manga, Kozue is captured and placed into a coffin for the sake of making Mickey duel against his will, but instead is captured by Utna's prince explicitly, hung above their heads. Being told they must duel at their best, another string of combat is forced through. Metal clashes upon metal, two bodies fighting for their separate goals. The idea of reaching a prince versus saving someone you love. And eventually, the duel concludes with that princely ideal becoming the victor yet again. In fact, Toka comments to Juri that it is thanks to Mickey clinging onto his sister, his desire to save her, that holds Mickey back from becoming an adult, fighting for someone he loved. The emphasis Toka puts on adulthood through the book seems that Mickey is constantly held back by this emphasis. And even Mickey seems to recognize Toga's words later on, where he finds himself unable to talk to Kozue about their future. But truthfully, Mickey is a 13-year-old boy that risked his life to save his sister. Not only do I feel sad that this virtue is played off for a bit of philosophy by one of his peers, but Mickey is a child. These are all children. They should be allowed to live as children. But Toga and his lessons are only ever adult, it would seem. At least when concerning Mickey. Mickey in many ways is the opposite of Toga, and I'm not talking about the color schemes here but the potential schemes and desires from Toga. Mickey sneaks Utna into Toga's home at one point to seek clues on end of the world. Mickey has a key, knowledge of the domain, and knowledge of a specific room that Toga keeps. This room, mind you, has a single bed in it, where Toga is later waiting for Mickey to join him in, with wine poured for the both of them. And... As the book describes, sweat, naked flesh, sheets, hand in hand, darkness, pain, hands and feet, sighs. And amongst this display, this is where Toga tries to tell Mickey of the difference between adults and children. In all regards, he is grooming Mickey. Is it simply because Toga will do whatever it takes to reach his ideals and share them in his pursuit of someone claiming revolution? Is there something within him that craves this innocence and the power over it as well? Regardless, it's a pairing that I do not see any real positive conclusion for. And Mickey, through verdant hopes, is trying to reach a point that he is strong enough to defend the things important to him, pushing himself to the concerns of Jury and Kozue. Sure, Mickey is finding ways to push himself and become stronger, even willing to compete in piano competitions now, and likely receive more recognition for his efforts. But to what end? This amorphous ideal that was placed in his head from people in higher standings? He still makes time for Kozue amongst all these events, but how long will the Mickey of the past be able to hold on, the one that is part of Kozue as well, before being flung into adulthood and left to whatever unknown lies ahead? The Call of Music It is only natural for us to meet on the stage, wouldn't you say? There have been multiple live stage musicals for Revolutionary Girl Utina, but we are focusing on the 2018 and 2019 productions. Revolutionary Girl Utina, Bud of the White Rose, and Revolutionary Girl Utina, Blooming Rose of Deepest Black. Throughout the musicals, Mickey continues to be Mickey, as we revisit the first two seasons of the anime. Though Mickey is more comic relief through these instances, and is able to show off his prowess on portable cardboard piano and shadow piano, I can only imagine the pain of having a large grand piano on stage in these instances, so we can just smile and accept Mickey is just more powerful than we expect. It is with this portable piano that he plays for the fourth wall breaking Nanami in the first musical, which could make him omnipotent as well, or at the very least willing to go along with Nanami in her delusions of an audience. We also get an idea of Mickey's usage of the stopwatch to which he reveals to Utna that he uses it 
to keep track of the amount of time he hates the student council itself. And instances of this usage can be interpreted in both musicals going forward as well, humorously enough. It is estimated that he hates the student council 42.195% of the time. So, for nearly half the time we see him, perhaps those two blue eyes are simply pools of hatred staring right back at him. Study time with Mickey is also less calm, as he tries his best to replicate the idea of an adult to stand up against Anthe's laughter and Utina's laziness as pupils, yelling to a strained but comedic tone. For those who wanted Mickey to panic yell frequently enough, well, here you are. There's truly a Mickey for everyone. Well, everyone but Kozue. Mickey continues to seek his shining thing, distanced from Kozue, blaming himself for the measles he had received the day of the concert. And since that day, Kozue has abandoned the piano, seeking the attention of boys so that perhaps Mickey will look back onto her again. Mickey, once so fixated on being at his sister's side, has now looked elsewhere. It is the same tale as the anime, but given more of a physicality, showing Mickey at his sister's side, playing with her, encouraging her, and making these promises that would be obscured by their complicated relationship. Also, to note, Kozue was played by one of these stylish black and white extras in the first play, while she gets a full outfit and design in the second play, likely between the increase of importance and increase of budget, judging by the stage size alone, just a fun detail more than anything. Both the duels are highlights of the stage play, as the first musical features two timelines fused into one, of the fight with Mickey and Jury. As the duels continue, the fight begins to phase between two duelists and their complicated baggages, respectively. However, as intensity begins to increase, eventually Utena is dancing with the blades of the handsome duo, parrying strike after strike. Though it is the end of the first duel that truly puts Mickey's personality center stage, so to speak. Both Mickey and Jury, just as they fought in parallel, have perpendicular responses. Mickey admits his faults, believing there is still room to grow for himself before thanking his opponent. Whilst Jury is caught in her own head, not believing the results and spitefully turning from the opposition, Mickey truly is a friend, even in the face of defeat. The duel from the second musical continues this duality of combat approach and is the first to be featured in the play, where Kozue's style is meant to reflect Mickey's, and so Mickey takes the stage to fight as well to emphasize this. And as the battle intensifies and Dios is brought in, it becomes a 2 on 2 duel for triumph. And it's very appealing to see the prince do something other than fall endlessly for about three seasons. Though, of course, Kozue loses. And it plays out as it did in the anime. But before we close the curtains, I'd like to emphasize the words that Akio dedicates to the siblings when it concerns the moon. The moon has no purpose, but looking at it brings us comfort. The moon may be shining, but it does not give off its own light. Rather, it's like a mirror, reflecting and illuminating over your heart. But should a shadow pass, you will feel lost. Perhaps you will feel lost. The Sega Saturn game is nothing too new for the character. In fact, the game itself acts as both a primer on the anime, as well as a heavyweight of fan service for those familiar to the series. The way it strikes a harmonic balance is something that would lead to a recommendation from myself. If it weren't for the overseas exclusivity and language barrier similar to the musicals. But if you do somehow come across this obscure gem through whatever methods you are able to, this game is no doubt going to spoil you with the bodies of many males. In fact, the intro itself flings the male nipples straight into your face with absolute flair. Nearly every male nipple, except for our innocent Mickey. 
It is not that Mickey does not receive any attention from this game of blush-worthy vanity. In fact, the special nude image you come across is far less bold than someone like Sionji, but at a null-like peace and innocence. Almost like a deer grazing in nature, Mickey exists in the distance. Many times emotionally and even physically, very often the one on the sidelines more than the active participant. Only when pushed into a corner, when he is afraid of losing something, is he willing to show his horns. This game is very romance heavy amongst its mechanics. You must interact with each of the student council members, as well as Utena, assuring their nobility is intact as you ward away the magical influences of Chigusa Sanjuin, another transfer student who entered the school the time you arrived with a dark past and spike towards you, even willing to sneak thumbtacks into your food in order to show her maliciousness. Her mere existence could parallel Nemuro, as she exists in the past, yet the present, referencing your father and her connections to him multiple times. For reference, you can name your character, but this person you play does have an established family, history, and somewhat personality that is directed by your own responses through a tree of results, ending after only a few days on campus. And with these romantic choices you can focus your heart on, wouldn't you wish to be tied in the ivory strings of this blue-haired bard? <laughs> Sadly though, the scholar's mind and attention are often distracted by the familiar faces of Miss Himamiya's allure and Kozue's antics. The sister is one of the few cast members outside of the student council that was reprised for this story, as she early on finds herself in the clutches of Chigasa, acting in the role of a prince from how Chigasa would word it, taunting you with such ideas before being escorted away by this blue-haired girl. Those who find themselves in Chigasa's grasp tend to lack nobility, a percentile mechanic from within the game dependent on how much attention you give them. Since Kozue, by personality alone, is not all too welcoming in the first place, perhaps Kozue was simply too far gone to begin with, making her an easy target. But more of those who are led into the grasp of Chigasa tend to act a bit off from themselves, sometimes clearly brainwashed in their actions. Kozue, however, never stops being herself. Can Chigasa's prince, in this case this blue-haired girl, be a prince without nobility? Or is this a fly flirting with the lips of a flytrap? Kozue still is sprinkled into Mickey's life, and if you pursue Mickey, at first Kozue will congratulate him on accruing the eye of a young woman such as yourself, but that tone reveals its true colors not too long after as Kozue puts pressure on the whole ordeal, becoming quite possessive of the boy and his time, such as a piece of personal time the twin shared over pieces of cake. It's almost sweet seeing these two enjoying time with one another if it wasn't for the sour ingredients that have been overbaked by this time. It's in interactions like these we get to know Mickey a little bit better one-on-one. -on -one. He is someone willing to put his emotions for Anthe into an envelope, but both unable to deliver such himself or even able to put the letter inside of the very envelope. He is someone that will appreciate you spilling soup on him when he gets heated up and appreciate more when you respect his privacy in the shower rather than sneaking a peek. He is the type of person who, when asking to grab some soy sauce for a meal, he will bring all types of soy sauce he can collect to assure that everyone has everything they need. Mickey is a heavily reliable person with good intentions in his head and is, at the end of the day, just a kid trying to get by with no real guidance from anyone around him. And with what company he keeps, I leave it up to you to draw your own conclusions here. His cluelessness in the face of things such as women and the pursuits of his fondness are aided by you, as you become somewhat of a big sister to him in one of his major routes, in shows of affections as well as ideas for first dates. That way, he may work up his courage with Anthe. Your character doesn't shy away from jealous thoughts kept to herself, but overall tries to share a heavy amount of empathy for everyone she interacts with, including Kozue after the jealous sister gives her the stairs treatment. 
Mickey even remarks, knowing of Kozue's behavior like this, and commends you for your show of kindness, trying to hide the fact. Your character makes it clear that she wants Mickey to have faith in his sister, in her shows of jealousy, and trust that he is important to her, despite the sabotaging nature. In the final encounter with Chigasa, you can choose to have Mickey accompany you to the final bout which Utena fights. In a regular run, you can empathize the need to help Kozue, but if you push for the romance with Mickey, he will rise to the occasion focusing on you and his feelings towards the person who has helped him so much in these days, fighting off the brainwashed student council in a rare treat for eyes. Duels. It is by the nobility of your chosen prince that you will survive. And after all the strife, breaking the item that holds Chigasa to this plane of existence. Long story. You stand victorious and alive, but not before you have to say goodbye one last time. Your father, who mysteriously has gotten sick after the duel, has forced you to transfer away. And that also means we must say goodbye to Otori Academy as well, including our blue-haired boy. This was not a story that you would be able to live in forever, but simply a nice glimpse into a storybook of princes and cruelty. When departing from Mickey, he attempts to chase you down to confess his love, but you stop him. You lie that you have a boyfriend back home, and that is the true reason for your transfer, that you miss this fabricated person enough that you'd lie about your father's illness. And when Mickey is faced with rejection, he worries that he's never going to find his shining thing. But as always, you support and assure him that he will. And as a last act of selfishness, kiss him good luck before your final goodbye. 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 My. 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 Lastly remains the Mickey of the film, Adolescence of Utena, where many characters reimagined in this story focused very heavily on Utena and Anthe in a school of shattered parts. Among the cast, though the lead of Toga is absent, Mickey still remains quite intelligent and well-regarded and remains at the side of Jury as a friend and rival, and perhaps even more from the way that Jury speaks to him, or the ways he can see through Jury. He is not the captain of the fencing team, and is one individual absent from dueling our pink-haired protagonist, but his demeanor cannot be more different. Mickey fully lacks a shining thing. He is still close enough to his sister that they live with one another, bathe with one another, and even trust the tidying up of one's appearance with a flat razor, he admits that Kozue will always be precious to him, but they can never go back to the garden. Mickey's skin is notably darker than Kozue. Perhaps he is getting more sunlight since the school lacks walls, but perhaps this is a design choice of a darker skin equates to a darker ideal. Personally, this interpretation makes me uncomfortable, but otherwise is a notable difference between the twins. Why Mickey is a duelist in this reality is explored, one in which he could have refused the call to the duels. But in truth, Mickey seeks more power for himself. Even by the end of the film, as Utena and Anthe are escaping, with the aid of the student council getting them to the bypass, Mickey makes a comment that high goals attract good company, and that these students plan on following in their footsteps, inspired by these goals. What are these high goals and what does he aim for? These are left unknown. Just as unknown is Kozue, who is turned into a car after holding a knife to her brother's throat in the bathtub. That rubber duck, with its moist exterior, is the indication of the Kozue timeline! I am not one to know how these car mechanics go. If it is mainly end of the worlds and or the student council's will, considering Wakaba and Utna, or if it is the character emotionally reaching some point. But regardless, other than putting his own sister into storage, does Mickey do much with this? What will you do when you escape, Mickey? What will you do? What? will you do? 
And thus, finally ends Woo! the episode of Mickey Kaoru. Khalil, how are we feeling today? I'm feeling good. How are you feeling, Professor? Tired. Uh, listeners, thank you so much for joining us on this journey, which is but a pit stop in a grander affair. Yes, and hopefully this grander affair won't take as long as it has initially. This overall video, as you can probably tell from all the instances, has all sorts of different microphones, recording techniques, and so on, because this is truly a time capsule of our time. There was a lot of hecticness, especially on my end, in which time and schedules were iffy, thanks to a year we all know as 2020 in, in general, and continued on into the 2021. But a lot of those issues that were available are now behind me, so hopefully we can get this next one out before 2024. For anyone who watched that first episode of our series two years back and stuck with us, sincerely thank you, and we hope to have our next series installment on Jury very soon. Very soon, very soon, hopefully so indeed. Uh, but in the meantime, if there's any sort of questions, comments, concerns, or anything that you liked or disliked from the video, please feel free to put a comment below and- SMASH THAT LIKE BUTTON! Or dislike button, really, either one. Like, whatever whatever you feel is best for this. We can still see it, though. We are still allowed to see that stuff, so. <laughs> but if there is something you dislike about the video, we would be curious, since we're going to be continuing the series, and maybe there's a way that we can improve what we're doing for the next one, so constructive criticism is much appreciated. Also, huge thank you again to Empty Movement, uh, Giovanna... Uh, Yasha and the whole group because there's been so much of a preservation effort on their part to keep Utsuna going which allows us to access this more translated material um, higher resolution scan for images and a lot of the resources that simply without them our video would not exist it might even be longer to make do happen yes do yes. happen <laughs> do happen or it would have been probably a much shorter form regardless hope you enjoyed this hour hope that you enjoy whatever amount of time happens next and be ready for the absolute destiny, Apocalypse.